A tēnā koutou katoa, ko karahuihui mai nē tēnei wā, a nō reira nau mai piki mai, a hari kōta ngākau ki te ke te a koutou hui mai nē tēnei wā. Nei rā ngā kaihaka tere o ngā waka haurua, a ko tau mai nei hei whiriwhiri, hei whakawhitiwhiti whakāro, hei kororo rero, ki ngā āhuatanga o te rā, me wera atu āhuatanga kato. Nō reira tēnei te mihi kia koutou katoa, te koutou hakaaro rangatira ki te tautoho ki tēnei kaupapa. Mihi hoki ki tō tātou rangatira a heke nuku mai puhipi i henga atu i te ngā tau pahure ake nei, nāna nei i haka tō te kākano e puwai ana i tēnei rā. Nō reira, e ngā mate katoa, haere, haere, haere. Tunga mate, ko te hunga mate, tātou tungura ki a tātou. Nō reira, tēnā kūta katoa. Welcome everybody and it's great to see so many people here supporting this discussion, this panel today. We have a very esteemed line-up here. They go back many years. Uh, many of them uh, were on, well, in fact, I think just about all of them were in the, the first echelon of uh, waka uh, voyages, kau moana, uh, and they all have one thing in common. They were all students of Hekanuku Mai Puhipi, um, who is now gone from us but has left a, a, a very strong legacy with regard to waka, uh, kaupapa waka voyaging, and celestial navigation. Uh, so uh, without further ado, to get started, I'd just like uh, the panel, starting with you, Stan, uh, introduce yourselves, give a brief overview of your background, roles, and experience in Waka. Kia ora, Stan. Uh, kia ora, Robert. Uh, kia ora, tātou katoa. Tēnā mi, honore tēnā ki te mihi atu ki a koutou. Ai, tēnā wā. Uh, no he. Uh, ko Ngāti Kuri Te Aupauri Te Rarawa a ngai takatonu Ngāti Kau uh, Tupukeu i Rotu i Te Kau Te Marae ko Pōtahi Marae ko Te Whare Nui ko Waimirirangi uh, Tuko Papa ko Niki Pereriki Kānara uh, Tuko Mama ko Kerawai Kānara no Herekino uh, Whangape uh, Tupuke Ia Ireira uh, ai, Ko Aue Tū i Nui a koutou i tēne wā uh, Kia ora everyone, my name is Stanley Conrad <coughs> I'm the uh, Kai hotu for uh, uh, Waka Te Aurere, um, which he built uh, in 1992. And, um, yeah, been uh, voyaging uh, since 85. Uh, and, uh, yeah, install there. Install, uh, now it's a different voyage, just helping with our rangatahi, teaching them the knowledge and um, kaupapa waka, being a kaumona on the ocean and stuff like that. So, yeah, nga mihi atu, nga mihi atu. Kia ora tātou, mene ki a tātou ki tō tātou, whare ki tā tātou, taonga e noho mai rā, ki o tātou tūpuna. Kia ora whanau, my name's Oti, I come from a little place called Kāwhia, that Rānu has come and hung out there with us and that's where I didn't know she was planning on this pretty cool thing that's happened to us where we can see this taonga. Um, actually, right in front of us, it's a pretty awesome uh, kaupapa, and I really want to thank her and her little and her team for working on making that a reality for all of us. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been doing waka stuff for quite a long time, and um, sort of waka waka on the awa, waka on the ocean, and um, sort of been hanging out with these fellas for years and years. So it's just good to be here with all of them. Tēnā tate. Mi mai ki a koutou katoa hui mai i roto i tēne wā i ngā ngami ki a koutou e arihi a tātou i tēne korirotia. Māori Besu i taku ingoa ko te arangi, te fresh ingoa o te tatara no te rarawa. I come from the mighty hokianga a kupe. Um, kia ora, 
Uh, but but depending on who I'm in trouble with, uh, uh, I, I, I connect into the north side, and mostly in Tararoe at uh, Orongote, I uh, like Paro del Marai on the north side of the Hokianga, next to the sandals. Well, we're right next to the sandals. We've got no trees, but we've got lots of sandals. And uh, and um, if I and if I get in trouble, then I go to the south side to my cousins over in Fidinaki and uh, and, sa- and claim my ngapu, but they are always in trouble, so I stay on the north side. <laughs> um, I, I've been in involved uh, uh, in Waka uh, with Stanley as a as a as a bailer on Natuki Matafaurua when we were young. Uh, we graduated to Kaihoi, and then we graduated to Kaihotu, and then uh, uh, we got so big that they ended up putting us in the kitchen. Um, and then uh, I also, uh, but, it, but it was always under the tutelage of Hector, Hikanuka Mai Puhipi and uh, Ngahiraka uh, as well. And um, so we had Waitangi and then... Uh, we, we talk about those moments that come a catalyst for change, and we heard that this morning about Tara. And uh, one of those catalysts was the arrival of Hokulea, um, the Hawaiian voyaging canoe to Aotea. And so it was, uh, that became the catalyst for change for Hekinuku Mai and for his merry band of men to say, well, if our Fanangas can come here, then we need to relearn that cordial and then the sale of us, and so um, one of the core group within the ODD, and been uh, yeah. So that's me. Next, Kira, Kira Kato, Kira Tena Rota Tato. I meet on the cafe to have a long meal. I'm going to make it in a few minutes. We're going to eat in the lab. Ah, we talk Tato too, but no, e tonga e wahora. As you heard. Uh, there's Stanley Conrad. He was born in the daytime, and I'm Joe Conrad, born in the nighttime. <laughs> but, uh, both brothers, and uh, I'm the current captain of Natuki Matafaru up in Waitangi. Uh, obviously, the, the largest um, waka being used today. But uh, yes, I've been around for 40 odd something years. Kai tono tono for Uncle Hector, um, and still here today. So. Uh, yeah, we like what you said. We've been a part of our. This is the uh, the OG team, I suppose, and uh, we're part of the Waka Kaupapa for many, many years. Later, I'm here to nui kia koutou katoa. He had a win takaro mo a kōrero o wene wene tohu no no ne tahaia. Ah, te na tatau. Ah, tua tahi mihi ana ki o koutou wihi o koutou wihi o koutou tapu. From Hokianga as well as Muri um, I just want to say I'm the youngest in the group today. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll use that as my platform to call it all. <laughs> Um, I, I actually, I actually want to acknowledge our facilitator, Rob Gable. Um, you know, he talked about you know these these pioneering tohunga sitting next to me, uh, but I need to acknowledge Rob as well because he's he's actually part of the foundation of everything that is Kaupapa Waka now. So, mm-hmm. up where Rob. Sure. Um, yeah, and beyond that, we you know uh, my uh, field of expertise, I suppose you could say, is um, Tarai Waka, which is the canoe carving, etc. So. Kwa Kua iau ko Tiaki Wepiha te kāpene Thatcher tōku ingoa, but you can all call me Jack. <coughs> uh, nō te tai rāwhiti a hau. Uh, taku pāpa e tipu ake i, 
i runga i ngā tapuai o, o te tai rāwhiti rā, mai whare kāhika ki uawa. Mera o ngā wāhi katoa kei, uh, kei waingunui a tērā. Uh, ko tōku māma e tipua kei ia uh, ki te taha o te aua whakatāne, ana oa. Uh, e tua kei ana ia uh, i runga i taku marae o, o wairaka, ana ko ngā te aua tōna iwa, uh, iwi. Uh, e noho ana au i roto o tauranga mona naini, Ah, mō te, mō te tino tata ki te katoa o taku nei au, uh, kei roto o tauranga mona a hau. Uh, nā reira, <coughs> that's me. I think I'll save all the rest of the quarter because I'm pretty much the one that talks the most. <laughs> <laughs> Until a little bit later. Uh, kia ora, Jack. Uh, while you got the mic there, uh, uh, or oh, Joe. <laughs> 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 uh, what, are, what are your thoughts about Tara, the shape, design, material, etc.? Hi, hey, but they bait in a rub. I think that question is on everybody's uh, mind. It's uh, right. like uh, Angie um, said today, that's more questions that came out of that, uh, especially for us that in, uh, in the Waka, Waka fraternity. But um, what I thought of it, I didn't think it was that, when I first saw it, I didn't think it was that big, uh, was, was that large, you know, when you see pictures of it, uh, it sort of blows you away when you walk in there and there it is in front of you, you know, so um, it's a tūpuna to us, it's a tūpuna, hara noe noe taonga e tūpuna, haka uh, hoki mai, ki tona kainga anō, it's good to see them here, it's good to... F- like uh, like Hotu or said this morning, or um, or Derek, so he can hear his people's voice. Mm. He can hear the mito of his land. Mm. He can hear the sounds of our birds and the rustle of our trees. And uh, our our land is a lot more richer by having him back here with us amongst us. And I think, and that's a that's what I thought when I first saw it, and. Uh, Obviously, uh, I'm not a scientist, but there was very many questions that uh, came into my head. And uh, come here to Kiawe Hohepa, number one. We had a little chiki mai te tatu ni tūpuna, ka hokinga mai te tainga ni. Engari, yeah, very, very interesting. And uh, still want to find out more about it, uh, how it was made, why it was made the materials that were used, the thought pattern behind the person that made it, uh, or other people that made it, you know, but very, very interested. I do come from a, a weaving background for my mum, was a weaver, so for a fellow that uh, always yearn to see those in a on a waka, now we sort of know what it sort of looks like now, and... Uh, Maybe one day, Nga Toki Matafaurua could be a, adorning one of those things and uh, wouldn't it be a, wouldn't be a great thing. But uh, my thoughts, awesome to have him home. Um, and uh, I hope that we learn a lot more about it and learn a lot more about our tūpuna and learn a lot more from our, our queers or kaumatras that uh, designed it and, and made it. Kia ora Māti. Can you tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are about today, and thank you, Jack, uh, Joe. Um, the shape, design, material, etc. Uh, well, uh, Father Pete from uh, from Multiti said, "We there's no such thing as owa in our language. So if we we don't know one, we'll make one up. <laughs> but this is not made up." Um, but about, uh, it was actually, oh, I love your fellow's technology that they got here with the pictures and with the zoom-ins and, and, and we actually spent most of our time looking at the zoom-in on the back of the cell because the amount of detail that's in there and um, there, were, there, were certain, um, there were certain ties and, and things that we saw in there and we're going... That's the same type of tie that we would lock, use to lock off, uh, to join parts of the Rauawa to the Hiwa. So joining, uh, adding an extra gunnel 
onto our canoes to give it more um, water line. But the, it's the same thing. It's uh, so, uh, but oh, it's, it's actually quite a hard thing to to think, and the the amount of detail that's actually done to do it at that micro um, uh, at that micro stage, just really in all of that um, of the school in there. And then we also looked. Uh, we saw some of the things because of the way it was um, it was. Uh, woven together in different sections and how it was joined in those sections as well. And and so part of it, it makes sense that where the joints are, you have the tassels for the tie-ons to the, to the mast and the boom. And so it's actually saying, well, it makes sense that that's how you would fold the, the sail. It won't be folded like that when you close the uh, thing. You would actually fold it down. And then one other idea we came up with as well, if you folded it down, you could, if you need to put it up quick, you put the pole up through, through the tassels quite quick and then it's quite easy to race. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, and I think it's... 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 Yeah, for our weavers, um, and that, and I think it can become the catalyst for to inspire our weavers, as much as Hokule when it arrived here, I mean, it inspired us to say go sailing and to learn those arts, and and the, um, and we heard the kōrero about how te Māori was used to inspire, to lift our people as well. And how he used that and two tangata to raise and lift up our people. Because I, it's, yes, it's going to be a hard job recreating all that stuff, but we got time now. We're, and uh, and it, it, it provides that challenge for us to hit at the hopo. No the fear and do it anyway. And that's what we should be saying to encouraging and supporting because our weavers are our navigators for the for their art. They can navigate the future about how we want to do that weaving because they're relearning that skill. And that's what we did. We just re relearning our skills. The corridor was there and we just had to relearn it and redo it and to do it. Good on. Kia Martin. Uh, Hotu, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that as well? What are your thoughts about te rā, the shape and design, material, etc.? Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, the first thought, I guess, that I can share with you is when I walked in there, it was breathtaking. You know, to um, see something so old that looked so fine and delicate and all those things and to I was like Derek I just wanted to go and grab it because mm. I wanted to have a chance to absorb that wairua that modi of all those hands from 200 years ago that made that and hopefully by doing something like that I might be able to get a chance to absorb what this ra or how this ra was actually used because really, um, you know, all of us have been involved in one small way or another in this whole wānanga about the sale. And uh, all we've been able to do is look at photographs and have little hui with Ranui and some of the other uh, people who have been, um, who've put their hearts and souls into this kaupapa. And all we could do is guess. You know, all, and all we can do is guess. Because, um, you know, I was sitting there with him and we were talking about it a little bit. And, you know, my feeling about something like that is, oh, yeah, I'd use it on the, I'd put it on our waka and try it out. But as soon as it started to rain or anything, any got windy, I'd be like, oh, I would put that away now, you know, because I'd be too scared to use it. So, you know, even in, in the sense of, was this actually something that was used? hard out like how we use it when we're sailing or if it was something that was created specifically for some kind of 
Pui or some kind of celebration, those kind of things. Um, there's a lot for us to wānanga about this sound because um, even the way it is and the way that our waka built uh, in terms of our waka toa and waka tete and those kinds of single hull waka, you know, it's a kind of, um, uh, I guess, accessory. You know, it's more than an accessory, but it's the kind of equipment that you'd have on a waka like ours that if you set it upright, it's really... It's really built for sailing with the wind behind you. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it will be great to be able to try and practice or, or, or experiment and test some of that kind of uh, uh, stuff with something like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that, um, uh, that in some way or another, the research occurs that allows us to, um, that allows our experts to recreate something um, that looks like that, that um, then the experts in actually using sails can go out and try. That's too valuable for us to just grab it and take it out on a wicker. But, you know, um, I think that there, there's probably some type of waka out there that this could allow us to learn about it. Like I said, you know, we've had all these wānanga about um, what it might be, what it might look, might be, mm -hmm. how it might be used, but actually seeing it as a whole different mm -hmm. game, yeah. it really changes the game, being able to stand and walk around it and see it close up, mm -hmm. to see the um, way it's been woven with those, um, those um, spaces mm -hmm. in the form and all those kind of things, and uh, to understand how that works with even with the pressure of wind against that sail, whether or not those spaces expand if the wind gets stronger or not, you know, it's, and are there kind of automatic, it's, it's like having automatic, uh, I don't know, with a system of automatically spilling the wind if you, if you get too much of it. So there's a whole lot of these kind of things that we won't really understand or know about until um, we get a bit more of a chance to to practice it, you know. And, and I'm just chucking this, I'm just going to chuck this out there to you guys because maybe it's not a sail. You know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a big kite or something. I don't know. But, but, you know, I think we have to, we have to be open enough in our thinking to look at what other um, options there are in front of us. I think it's a sail. But, you know, in saying that, we still need to be able to think about it and go, is it something else? Mm. And so, and, and because it's so beautiful, and because it's so fine and delicate, like I said, you know, if I had it on our worker, I wouldn't use it much. Because mm. I'd be scared that something would happen to it. Mm. And the owner's come and seen the, the, the um, fibre, woven fibre cells that I have on our worker, and they're really quite... Um, clunky compared to this. They're really, really thick. They're heavy. And um, it's a real difference. But I just want to thank you and the team and everybody who worked hard to bring it here because I would never have got a chance to be here and look at something so awesome today. Whatever. What are your thoughts, uh, Stan, on, on, on the, the on tera, the shape and design? Ah, I told you that. I mean, I told you the quarter. Um, I think when I first saw it, I just uh, in my head straight away. I was like, like Hutu. Um, first, I wouldn't mind grabbing it and putting it out there and seeing if it all how it fits on on a waka. But um, but um, having that eye and actually fire and and, and you fellas bringing it here, I think it's it's going to be the start of more. It's going to be the light that's going to start these. Because it's just, it's even the, the, the ra is going to be the pinnacle of how we're going to see how sales are made. Because that's just one sale. Yeah. There were lots of sales our Tupuna made for different purposes, for different ways of using the wind, you know, because it's just not one. They, they, this is amazing. This is, to me, this is how amazing our Tupuna were for the, um, the technology, the way they built these sales. But then, like what you would say, there were sales for certain things, and depending on the types of 
um, wind conditions you had on the water, you had to have a certain style to to harness that wind and to use that wind to drive your locker forward. So um, whether we, rip, you know, my thing is to replicate it, have a tutu with it, because all of us are tutus. I'm a tutu follower. All of us are tutus. We like to get out there and trial things, and and that's how we learn those sort of things, or or retrace, or learn that knowledge of how our, our ancestors will sail a waka, especially if it's a coastal waka. Um, on the open ocean, it's a it's a different sort of um, sail um, we use on our on our on our waka hodus. But um, for me, um, having the ra here, it's going to reignite um, the light within us as as if it's a people to think about um, the, 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 the ra being the start of building ourselves. And then, of course, the weaving is, is weaving all of us together to, to create these, <coughs> this beautiful, um, these beautiful things, these beautiful ra, these things that are coming, because it, it is coming. You know, it's not something we put away like Hoji to Mataku to use it, but it's a start mm -hmm. of opening things up and revisiting those, those, those pathways that we've done as voyagers you know, retracting back where our tupunas came from. Um, that's what the is going to be doing. And how we do that is going to be amazing. It's an amazing journey. And this is like another part of Voyage. Yeah, Kia ora. Good boy, Steve. Your turn, Jacko. <sighs> You're the youngest. I'm the youngest. Oh. Um, uh, I kind of landed in this space this morning after sitting here and talking through, you know, ideas and stuff with our rangatira here and with other people who were coming through there are at that time. I kind of landed in this space of, I don't know what it is. Um, I, I have more questions than answers to give anyone. And I think where all of us were leaning was, you know, <clears throat> because we're in the... Um, you know, we're in the uh, practice of applying that matauranga to see a tonga like that come out. It, it really makes us, we have to challenge our own thinking. So it's, it's really challenging for me to look at that and um, think, okay, was it, if it's a practical sale, you know, in our, in our minds we view it as a tonga. It was potentially, you know, and we, how we view tonga is that oh, we put them away and we don't we don't use them. But perhaps there are wasn't like that for our tupuna. Perhaps it was something you know that they applied in everyday use. So you know, I'm trying to challenge myself around um, <coughs> its purpose. Uh, you know, I think a lot about the physics behind the shape. Um, you know, it's got a single stay line off the front. It has the you know, the, um, I forget the, the name of the feather thing at the back. We would call it a telltale, I suppose, for, you know, indicating one direction. The feathers at the top at the waha tell a story as well, you know, because you'd be reading the vortices that come up through the sail as it's, you know, pressurised by wind. The awa matangi with the holes, you know, to spill wind under pressure. You know, there's all those sort of technical aspects about the ra that, you know, came up for me. And which eventually landed me in a space of, a, I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, but that's just being honest about it. Um, and I think like Hotu and Stanley are, are saying, you know, we really need to, uh, at the very least, take the shape of it and start testing things there. Um, and then through replication, we can probably gain a lot more knowledge around, you know, how that sail acts. But it is, you know, more it's a real taonga, that thing. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I think replication and uh, application will probably be the next steps for us to think about. And we've got plenty of waka we can throw a replica one on. Bye-bye. <laughs> 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 I'm pretty sure it's a sale. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, one I think is a perfectly woven sail. Um, mm. I've been in uh, places where I've watched uh, um, Wahine up in Micronesia uh, mm. making sennit. And they make the finest sennit you've ever seen in Micronesia. You go to Samoa, this is rather thick. Uh, you go to Tonga, it's the same. But you go to places where they're not affected by modern living, 
they live uh, on an island like the one we went to with Sotawal, and uh, where, you know, they don't have inhibitions about, you know, all the way in there, they just wear a model, and uh, so do the men, uh, you know, and there's no inhibitions around those sorts of things. And what they do is they just work. Uh, they weave senate, they weave bariki. Nothing is uh, as intricate or as, I, I think somebody said delicate. I don't think they're delicate. Uh, because the weave, the smaller the weave, the stronger the fabric. Uh, you look at cotton. Cotton is such a fine thing that when you weave it all together, it makes a really strong cloth. Uh, you know, and I think, uh, from my perspective, looking at the way the weave of the tera is, it's strong because it's so fine. And uh, I was thinking too about um, about about uh, how long would it take uh, to create a sail like that? I don't think very long at all. Because uh, the, the re no, no, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't. I, I think uh, most of the work is going to be is going to be in you know when you when you get your materials, uh, the preparation, but the weaving itself I think isn't because uh, I've watched. Up in uh, up in Tonga, I was watching these ladies weaving reasonably fine, you know, about this thick, uh, fariki of their stuff. I can't remember what you call it. Uh, and uh, and there were like twenty women in this room, all of them, some of them working on the same panel, but they were making panels just like those. And uh, that's out there. Those are small panels compared to the ones that they were weaving, uh, although way more intricate, uh, way more intricate. And I think, uh, you know, today we look at that and we think about our weavers and we think, wow, it might take them a long time because there's so few of them. Well, there weren't so few back in those days. All of our kuya, all of our wahine would have been put to work uh, creating the sails. So for them, you know, a matter of maybe a couple of weeks and you've got something that you can put together. I think the, for me, uh, most amazing part of the, of the sail itself, of Tara is the joining of the of the um, of the panels and how they weave them backwards both ways and they create some strength there because uh, I remember talking to uh, to Hector about uh, that um, uh, uh, especially the sale that's up at uh, Rarawa right uh, she made those mm -hmm. she, she, she wove those for uh, for um, Tinana uh, Tinana tina. tina. yeah the waka for that went um, uh, built for 1990. That dra is beautiful too, nowhere near as intricate. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the um, when you when you look at Tera and you think, well, Auntie Didia could weave that, and she didn't take that long. Uh, her, her, her ra, and uh, and I think that um, you know, uh, weaving something like that wouldn't have been such an arduous uh, uh, task. Uh, for those people, because uh, it was a daily task. Uh, you wouldn't give it to a bunch of men, though, you know, big fingers and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we'd make holy ones, but um, <coughs> uh, just judging by how we are today. <coughs> but um, you know, just just going back to the to the cell, it's so it's so beautiful and intricate. Um, I, I actually think it's uh, it's a small cell, so it's not it's not a voyaging cell. Definitely not that. It definitely is, in my perspective, a, uh, a uh, downwind sailing uh, ra. Uh, so on our single hold waka, you'd have a little frame that, that, the, that the ra would fit in. Where those little loops are, they loop down on a pole. So you have two poles. You've probably got a cross beam and another pole there. So when you pull it up, easier to get up and it'll catch wind. It'll make a little uh, bulb, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as it's catching wind and help drive downwind. You could probably do a little bit of uh, um, turning the sail to uh, mm. to enable you to keep the wind there in the direction you want to go, as long as it, uh, d uh, I don't think, from my perspective, it's not a reaching sail. Reaching sail is when you've got the wind directly side on to your to your hole, so you're going at right angles. That, that would be too difficult, uh, I think. That's only my own personal opinion. Uh, but uh, downwind sailing, you could turn it in different uh, directions, and you'd have uh, Toto on each of those outer poles to be able to pull it in and uh, change the shape of the sail to uh, capture wind that might be coming from a different direction. You know, that sort of stuff. We do that all the time on our waka. We trim our sails uh, to make sure that we can try and get to where we're going. 
but the reality of sailing out on ocean is is a lot different, I think, to how these sails were in our tupuna, uh, built big paddling canoes down here. Mm-hmm. And so most of the power was uh, uh, in the arms of those men that had, uh, had the hoi. And then uh, when they got to a point where they could, uh, they'd put a sail up and sail downward. Uh, you know, make, uh, take a little bit of weight off the, uh, off the, off the paddlers. That's, that's where my thinking is going. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, but I, uh, I just, I'm just totally amazed at uh, at um, at the, the ra itself, and all of those things. You know, we we talked about those lashes down the side uh, to give the each edge of the of the ra strength, uh, and then the interweaving of the of the panels. And um, I remember, I remember. Can you hold it? Uh, Hector and I were talking about <laughs> and This is what you get for being the young one. <laughs> Hector and I were talking about um, about how uh, uh, Auntie Didier had, had woven her, her, her panels together. And she had them woven in, and we were going sort of like that. And so this is like the catches the wind. So when you go like that, it's strong. Locks in. Yeah, lock, locks in and locks. And then when the wind's too strong, it'll part. And then, uh, and that's when you know, oh, got to pull it in, and then you, you put your sail down because your wind might be too strong, you know, things like that. I, I think that that sail would take a lot more wind uh, than uh, than possibly mm. the sail that was made for Tinana, mm. uh, mainly because that fine weaving gives it more strength. That's what I think, anyway. So I told you I talk uh, a lot more than these other fellows, <laughs> uh, and I. But I, what, I, what I think the greatest thing that, um, that that's happening with Tara at the moment is that it's generating interest uh, from us, and already yeah. we're already thinking about you know how can we wind under this better. I mm. uh, and I have a tunnel. Can I have the first sale? <laughs> yeah, <can we? laughs> I'm just kidding him before Hutu because he's always first. <laughs> it's okay. He thinks it's a club. I'm stuck there now and uh, uh, wait for the next one. Hmm. Jello um we will move on a little bit. Uh, Polynesian sail uh, differs in design, uh, in, in particular that it's. Uh, an inverted triangular shape compared to European sailboats. Uh, what are the main features of the, of the Polynesian sail? And why do you think it was designed that way? Uh, Stan? Um, <clears throat> gee, I wish Jack would answer this one, but get the point. Um, you know, when we, are, when we are on the ocean, and um, the thing about the, the waka haurua, it's, uh, one, it's, we la- it's all lashed and, and stuff I'm bearing. There is a time when you drive the canoes, uh, we drive them hard. Um, mm-hmm. But with the, the design of the sail, that what we call the latine, there's one shape of sail which is wider at the top and narrower at the bottom, similar to the, the ra. And then we have another one which is called a crab sail, which has an angle. And you'll see there's a little, I saw a little diagram in the museum, that little waka, a little Hawaiian waka, um, with that type of sail on. And the reason for the, the wider part of the, of the sail being so high up is when the canoes are driving in the ocean and you've got the, the big swell and um, you've got to keep the canoe going all the time, having that wider part of the sail higher, you can still drive off the ocean swells, like you know the wind's still blowing off the top, it helps for that canoe to keep it sailing through um, those heavy seas, especially within the swells up. And, you know, and um, they've got limits. Um, we can't tack the canoe or we can't mm. put, point the canoe high into the wind because those sails don't allow us to do that. So pretty much, if you got the the, the wind on your pretty much on your beam or, or slight quarter forward of your beam, um, you can pretty much drive those um, canoes pretty good and get a good speed up on them. And they also help with the likes of um, the steering, um, keeping the canoe in the direction where you want to go. And it just um, gives you a bit more. Um, you have the control. Um, of the canoe when it's in that sort, of, if the sails in those sort of positions, but then um, <clears throat> um, for that latine and that crab type shape of sail, 
there's only one part where we find pretty um, mataku when we're sailing, which is, is downwind sailing, um, where we actually call this type of sail, uh, we butterfly the sails. If we have a, a main sail and a second main, we call it a main and a mizzen sail, we butterfly them out. So one sail swung out to one side and the other sail swung out to the other side. And we're driving the canoe down, downwind, having the wind on our back. Um, that's one of the most dangerous, uh, skillful parts of sailing wakahaurua because if you don't have yourself in that control of the waka, um, you pretty much can lose it really quick. Um, you can turn the waka side on. You won't actually, if you get it to a point where you want to flip it, you can. But um, that's the part where those sails, uh, you sort of don't have that control on them. But if you do, then you can get away with it. But if you happen to lose your concentration on that, that type of sail, you can pretty much put the canoe into a, what we call an uncontrolled jibe, which sends you flying across the deck, bearing the canoe into a wave and sending everything all over the place and having the kaihotu or the navigator filling, your, filling the words with uh, all sorts of language um, and keeping that thing. So, um, but that's the reason for the, for the type of sail we have on, 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 on the wakahodu is this, we've got the Latin type of sail, we're wider on the top and narrow on the bottom to help that waka drive itself through the through, through a, a swell or a heavy sea that's there. So, yeah. Kapai, cool. Kapai. Stan, have you got anything to add to that, Hotuwa? Yeah, Stan did a pretty good job on yes. that quarter, actually. So, yeah. I don't know. I think one of the things for us to understand, too, is that uh, one of part of that design with the sales that Stan was talking about is that um, we have to be able to um, get rid of a lot of wind quickly too. and so so we it's a matter of not overpowering the waka to the extent that it's that you're in danger of capsize mm -hmm. so it's, it's to um, have enough have a cell that's uh, in a shape that can drive you well and can keep up a good pace on the on the ocean but also not to the not to the point that it's going to have so much um, power that's going to tip you over and so those are things that when, when I say caps I mean sideways and when uh, Stan was talking about how difficult it is to go on a downwind run run, I think one of the biggest things was just to be able to stay straight mm -hmm. um, and it's a hard thing for a lot of uh, new or inexperienced steerers or helms, helms people to actually keep a waka because when it's when you've got the wind behind you, sometimes um, you've actually got a swell running with you as well. So your waka wants to surf, and you sort of and it wants to run off one way or the other. And so you've got to always be aware of all these things and still keep hoping that you're not um, that the sail's going to help let some of the wind go away on you as well. So there's a lot of stuff for us to be thinking about, and I think uh, maybe as time and further research into this sale mm. continues on. Then we can start doing some real comparative analysis around this mm. type and some of the other types of um, sales that are all around the Pacific. Because mm. um, you know, I know that in the British Museum there was there's a sale. They know it's a sale now, but they originally just had it rolled up and stashed over there, and they just said it was a mat from French po a mat from French Polynesia. But it's actually a sale because these old drawings of waka from that part of the Pacific that show that shape sail um, on them. So um, I think it's this has given us a chance, the shape of this sail has given us a chance to be thinking a bit more about um, the applications of different types of sails, not just here but all around. Mm. Tim Wan and Uyaki where and see what works. So, um, like Jack said, you know, he wants to get that first um, sail and have a picture around. We like that. It's a good idea. It needs to happen um, soon because um, <laughs> of what that does, and like Stan said, too, it, it, because Tena is here, it, it gives us the. Um, it's opened the door for us to start trying to uh, go down the path of returning or attracting. Attracting old taonga like that, that um, reflect the 
the true mātauranga of our tūpuna. Because I think that's a big one, is that, you know, when you watch a Sao GP mm. uh, waka go for it? Um, I, I, I love it because mm. I believe that those are like the great, great, great grandchildren of the waka that our tūpuna sailed on. Mm. I think it's awesome. Mm. But also if you have a look at some of the shape mm. of the, those, those wings that they use on the, you know, it, that's quite close to some of the old designs of um, sails that have been recorded in some of the old drawings. And so I think this is the first step in, uh, I guess, the, the recovery and the, the, the chance to actually tell the true story of the engineering and design uh, power of our tibuna. Mm. Because, uh, because that was their world, they were pretty good at designing and inventing things that allowed them to be real good at what they did. Mm. So they could sail all around the place. They could um, sail across, be beyond the horizon and not be afraid of falling off the edge of the earth, <laughs> all those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, I, I think that this is what Tera and the design of this sale allows us to start thinking about, is um, what, are the, what are the dynamics, what are the physics, what's the maths? You know, because people, people don't equate those types of Western concepts around mm. the things that we do. Mm. Mm. And so the ability to bring that, to, to show people that the actual mahi of our ancestors in the right context um, is science, it is maths, it is technology, mm. it is design, it's engineering, it's all of that stuff. And just in, in our tonga over there is our first real opening of the door for us to say this is what our world is like. Mm. So it's just like, a, I just got to thank you all again because it's just awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Well, uh, the Waka Eye Control has a hundred sails on it <laughs> and uh, they're called paddles. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, not too long ago, the big Wakatoas had sails like Tera. Mm. And uh, to beat Jacko and Hotu, I should have the first one to <laughs> make <laughs> But yeah, Hotu, you know, our, our Komatos, our Tupunas, were the, some of the most engineering people that ever walked on this earth. And if you just have a look at Tera, uh, <coughs> the the thought pattern behind it is amazing, you know, and the uh, Kororo Martin, some of the Roto Tena thing, it replicates some of the waka when we do our Lashia waka. So, yeah, so I still, uh, Auntie, make sure that uh, that first sale you make comes to Natuki, but I'm quite willing to try it out on Natuki as well, so, uh, <laughs> and I won't damage it, but, uh, nah. <laughs> promise. I promise. <laughs> But if it comes up to Napu and Fare Tapu and Napu, he mightn't go back to, Hol uh, to England again. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it's an amazing piece of engineering that uh, that cell we got over there. Amazing piece of engineering. I go to, I'm just chuffed to, to finally see it. Good boy. Kill the joke. I'm going to lean in a slightly different direction, but it does total everything that these fellows have been saying. Um, you know, um, within our kōrero tukuiho, we have these um, kurahuna, you know, these hidden, these hidden things within the stories that our tūpuna handed down to us. And I want to go back to the story of Rata. And I, I don't know, you know, if you guys... Briefly, Rata goes to build a mawaka, chops down his tree, forgets his karakia in the forest, puts his tree back up. And that happens a couple of times until he realises he's done the wrong things. And he has his karakia, and then the forest, and the people of the forest actually help him complete his waka. Anyway, one of the lesser known parts of that story is when Rata actually sets out to... Um, 
find the person who murdered his tupuna. Um, and the, the name of that person was Matuku Tangotango. And uh, as some of you will know Matuku Tangotango in the Pacific anyway as the bittern, as a manu, as a bird. Um, and so when Rata finally catches up with Matuku Tangotango, um, uh, the story goes, you know, he knocks him over. I'm being really light about the Kōrero Um <laughs> Knocks him over. Um, the body of the bird is then placed underneath Rata's canoe. And the wings are severed and placed on top as sails. So, you know, the, the, the idea that our tūpuna didn't know that the physical, you know, the principles behind an aeroplane wing and a sail are exactly the same is not quite right. Mm -hmm. Because hidden within that story is exactly that. <coughs> I was watching the America's Cup um, one year and, uh, you know, they were going on about the technology of an aeroplane wing and it's essentially what they're doing on the America's Cup boats and I could only sit there and think about our tupunarata and say, oh, well, you know, you know. We already knew that. <laughs> um, but that, what that entire story represents is a major technological innovation at that period amongst our tūpuna. And the other major innovation that's happening at that same time comes from a tūpuna uh, known in Hawaii as Hilo. Uh, Hilo through Central Pacific, and we, we know him as Fido. Um And he was one of the, the more renowned navigators of that period. Well, the, the innovation that uh, Hilo comes across is he actually begins to master the idea of planking canoes together. So, um, you know, what that allows our people to do is build bigger, larger waka in order to, you know, go further across the Pacific. And it's around that period, too, that we see our children are moving mostly, you know, our, our biggest exodus, I suppose you could say, is happening at around those periods. Um, what was the question again? Hang on. <laughs> no, I was going somewhere with all of that. So when we arrived here in Aotearoa, however, you know, we had this massive resource uh, available to us, and what happened was a devolution in our technology, if you like. Uh, I, I, I don't like that word, but what happened when we got here, our, our trees were bigger, we had more of them, uh, we had that much resource. We didn't have to voyage as much. So I think over time, um, sorry, we redeveloped and recalibrated what what waka and our our ocean life looked like. When, by the time Cook arrived, and when he arrived in the Bay of Islands in the north, um, one of our he was met by one of our tupu, tupuna tapua, who was the father of a rangatira called Patuoni. Um, and Tapu had just kind of come up pedaling up, you know. And he was on a, he was on a, um, he was on two single hull waka that had been lashed together for the purpose of offshore fishing trips. And that on that waka they actually had a sail. That the the corridor around the sail actually comes from some of his uri that I've spoken to. Um, it's not actually noted in any of the, you know, Banks's or Cook's journals, um, but the the corridor is certainly there. So from that that mass exodus period of our tupuna across the Pacific until then, we had major shifts that uh, altered the designs of not just ourselves, but our waka as well. And most of those were environmental in nature. But that wasn't a bad answer. Kapoi, kapoi hiri. Jacko, you'd like to Sorry. comment on that? <coughs> Do you want me to hold it? Oh, oh maybe in a bit. I think we were talking about the shape of the cells. Yeah. Oh, the design? It, 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 yeah, so, um, well, you know, voyaging what I do best is going downwind. Uh, but, you know, if you've, uh, we, we, we sort of talk about sailing with the wind on our beam, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a good place to have the wind, you know, to, uh, to go straight or reasonably shaped. But the waka never goes straight, never goes like that, it always goes like this. <laughs> oh, you know, that's the wind pushing it sideways as you're trying to make it go straight. Mm. So your target can't be from here to there, it's got to be from here to there. And you just 
point in that direction and you know that you're going to go sideways to get there. And uh, so the reason that happens a lot is because our shale shapes have uh, a high centre of effort. What that means is, is that where the, the power where the power comes is higher than what a conventional sail would have because most of the sail space, I suppose, is lower on a yacht than it is on the waka. It's, it's actually higher uh, because of the inverted um, shape of, well, <coughs> sorry, European sails are inverted, ours are the right way up. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and of course, uh, um, a lot of our waka were lower uh, um, on the ocean. My waka in particular, uh, Nahiraka Mai Tafiti, uh, she's so low <clears throat> where you're almost sitting on the ocean uh, uh, on, on our deck. And, um, and so that means that uh, a higher centre of effort uh, means that you do get wind that's able to help you move along, even though uh, trying to drag two, uh, uh, trying to drag nine tonnes of log through the water is not always that easy on light winds. <laughs> um, but um, I think the, uh, 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 our tupuna uh, would have created sails and, uh, like that because they understood that they needed to have that higher mm. uh, centre of effort, especially uh, when it comes to uh, sailing downward because uh, it, uh, it, uh, it's a little easier. Not directly downward, like Stan said, uh, that's actually quite difficult to do. Uh, but um, if you got it on a on a on a stern quarters, uh, which is you know sort of like, here's, if this is the beam, 45 degrees this way is the stern quarter, uh, you know, and the wind comes in there, you put your sails out on both sides and she slides really nicely uh, in the direction you you uh, you're hoping you're able to make. Um, but um, our uh, our uh, uh, teacher Mo Pialu, he always used to uh, to say uh, uh, these very cryptic uh, uh, things. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is uh, when you sail, you 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 want sail here to here, but first you go this way, then you go this way, then you go this way, then you go this way. Ah, but you make straight. I <laughs> 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 you know uh, those sort of that that sort of corridor. You have to think a lot about uh, what he's saying, but. <laughs> The reality of that is, is that um, with our sails, our sails are made uh, um, to uh, uh, to move with error. Mm. Mm. Uh, and what we do is try and reduce the amount of error we create mm. uh, in our sailing. And uh, when you do that, uh, you uh, you can you can move in a final line. Of course, uh, you know um, Toharol and all those other guys that said we couldn't do west to east. Uh, they were wrong. It's actually better going west to east. Uh, you know, Toa Howard said, uh, oh, we came from the Americas. We put all our families on a raft, went out and drifted around hoping we'd find land. <laughs> Reality of that is, is not true. Yeah. Uh, first, you explore. Christopher Columbus, he did that first. He didn't take his wife. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he took a whole bunch of olives thought they were going to fall off the edge of the world. Uh, as Woodrow said. And that's, that's, that's the truth of it. So, you know, you go and explore, <clears throat> and then you find. So, uh, one of the things about our about our waka is uh, about our tupuna is with their waka is that uh, it took a long time. You know, seven thousand years ago they left Taiwan or wherever it was, came down through the Pacific, arrived in Samoa, Tonga, and and uh, in Fiji reasonably early, like about fifteen hundred years before Christ was born. And um, and uh, I read this book called uh, Hokulea Wei Tahiti, and a guy called Ben Finney, he wrote that for some reason they stopped for a thousand years, and then we don't know why they carried on uh, from there. And then it took them almost four and a half, three and a half thousand years or whatever it was to get to, to that point, a thousand years waiting, and then within 500 to 800 years later they had populated every other place in, uh, in the Pacific. So the reality of that is, is they were refining their technology. Mm -hmm. uh, first, you start off with a raft. Seven thousand years ago, you know, because there's little waterways you've got to cross. You get on those big islands, you walk through them, and you get to a place with another bit of water. Oh, you dug out canoes, get made. Then uh, the water gets a little lumpy. You put an umbrella on it, and a little bit more distance, you stick a sail up. 
uh, you know, and uh, rudimentary sail maybe. And then uh, you cross that, that particular part, you get to the next spot where, oh, no, it's 60 miles away. I can just see that island. How am I going to get there? Uh, I put two of on, make the sail a little bigger, and I get there a little quicker. And then uh, they finally ar arrived in, uh, in places where uh, islands were out of sight. Uh, then the technology evolved again. Mm. Uh, and eventually they arrived in Samoa Tonga, and, uh, and the widest area that they had to cross would have been 400 miles. That's quite a long way. And it takes like four days, though. Mm. Uh, you know, on Hotu's Waka, maybe three. <laughs> With the new sail. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the second one. <laughs> and, um, and then all of a sudden they get to Samoa and Tonga and the distances are wider and the conditions are harder because trade winds. Trade winds coming through. And so they learnt about uh, seasonal change uh, over a period of time. And they learnt that every now and then you get counter winds and counter currents. We can, long, we can jump onto those, help them, help us to go more easily. So on an El Nino season, you got that. Mm. Uh, you know, and so they learned over time that, uh, that certain sales did certain things for them. And so they created a whole bunch of different types of sail. If you have a look at a lot of the pictures of, uh, of uh, the different sailing waka uh, that our tupuna had, uh, you know, uh, um, there's all sorts of different shapes. And that's because they were refining mm. their technology to find the perfect, uh, I think, sails to help them uh, populate the rest of the Pacific. Mm. And not only that, but you get to Samoa and Tonga, there's a, like 1,500 miles from there to the Marquesas. That's the next place they populated. There's islands pocketed through that area. The winds are contrary. So you go out for a few days, zigzagging backwards and forwards. You run out of water and kai, and you know, oh, I know the way back because the stars are telling me it's straight back that way. I turn around, the winds help me get back fast. Five days out, one day back. It just took a thousand years for them to be able to bridge that gap and refine their technology, refine their ability to uh, find a pathway and to hold a pathway and to wayfind their way across, the, across that particular part of the ocean. Once they refined that, they had the tools they needed to populate the rest of the Pacific and bring the Kumara back into central Polynesia around the time of Christ. Uh, you know, so Te Ra is actually, I, I actually think the, the um, Te Ra is a highly sophisticated sail uh, that's at the upper end of where I think our, um, our technology reach. It's just that we maybe had put aside the need for for creating voyaging sails because we were no longer doing that. Mm. Uh, you know, so we're re we're recreating the pathways and what we what we're doing today, and uh, and sharing what we learn with our younger generations now, and because um, uh, we we don't want that to be lost again. Mm. Uh, you know, and uh, and having Tara come back. Uh, and I know that uh, Fairani and, and her team are going to perfect that art again. And so, uh, you know, the, for those of us that uh, that hold our breath and wait for our sail, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we've got to be a little tongue in cheek. Hey, um, what we know is is that the end result is that our our kairaranga are going to be more sophisticated in how they and how they present their work to the world from here on, just with the, uh, I suppose, the, uh, the tawira of te rā as the centrepiece for, I suppose, evolving uh, that technology even more. Mm. Yeah. Kia ora, Jack. Kia ora, Jack. Kia ora, Jack. Have um, any of the panel got anything else they'd like to add before I open it up for the for the audience to pass uh, questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'd just like to open it up for. Did you want to say something, Marty? Uh, Cole? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just, just um, open for questions. Anybody would like to ask these one of these gentlemen or all of them a question? Kilda. 
I just have a question about the panels and just to hear some thoughts because um, I sell as well and I was just wondering would they would they do for those types of sales um, the right type of sale Polynesian sale do you do you reef them can you reef them or not like just because of the panels just wondering <laughs> Um, just looking at today, I don't think you would want to reef uh, something as beautiful as that because uh, you weaken, um, you would weaken the weave, uh, especially around the joints uh, by by trying to reef them. On modern sails, uh, because they're they're basically you know really strong fabric, um, you can you can reef them up without damaging them. Uh, although uh, reefing does damage anyway, so um, um, the 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 best way uh, um, uh, uh, for that is uh, is to build and uh, is to build a fail safe in uh, in the cell that you have and I think that's what the panels are um, when the panels come apart the the main weave isn't 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 uh, um, affected as much as where the join is and uh, I I don't know I couldn't tell you whether you, that would be the easiest way to fix them but I would certainly guess that might be uh, why uh, panels were made in the way they were woven in that in that way and it's like I said you know with that uh, with that uh, the way the weave is and, uh, and it tightens up when the catches wind mm -hmm. and then the, when the wind's too strong if you notice a give then you would just pull it down and uh, and wait for the winds to recede a little mm. before carrying on uh, you know, those are those are sorts of things. So fail safe, I think, is uh, is one of those things that is uh, that you can see inbuilt. in inbuilt into the into the cells by putting panel, the panels together in the ways that they have those joints. Most of our modern cells, uh, you know, they're just one piece of of uh, dacron or cloth, whatever that canvas. <clears throat> and so when you reef them, yeah. uh, you, you've got no other way. There's no fail safe in that except by reefing to bring down and. And, um, and minimise your your uh, your wind space. Uh, so if you want to continue on sailing, uh, if it gets too strong, you just pull them down all together and sit there and wait. But um, yeah, I think that I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Um, um, thank you for that. And can I just do a quick um, follow up question um, with the the design with the um, how it's open. Wo woven open the zigzag that goes through the whole sail does that kind of indicate that there was a second sail that was f fully woven just wondering about the the open weave that goes through the zigzag mm. and how you um, there's a couple of you have spoken about how the that open weave um, area is what the wind goes through into um, so I was just wondering um, if there was a second sail that the wind gets directed to because of that because of that sail like just wondering about that yeah. anyone want to answer? hadn't thought about that one <laughs> but um, but I think the from what we've been looking at so far it's just trying to understand it those open weaves that we see in the in um, the sail uh, are, are like what Jack was talking about. It's a kind of fail safe kind of thing. It's just that if so that the wind that the sail doesn't get so overpowered that it creates um, difficulty yeah. difficult for, difficulty for you when you're sailing. Ideally, you'd have a you know you have a wardrobe of sails if of a traditional shape that. If it was starting to get too windy, you'd pull one lot down and you'd put some smaller ones up mm -hmm. and that kind of thing to solve your issues. Mm -hmm. Because um, because of the way, the, even on Te Aurira, you know, when we, mm -hmm. we've been sailing around, we've tr because we use this old uh, uh, modern material, we can sort of scrunch it up a bit and, and do that mm -hmm. for our reefing. But the ideal would be to have different size sails mm -hmm. for different types of wind mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. And um, like in, I guess... In tying that into what Jack was talking about, it's that whole idea of um, having different sails for different conditions and different may that you and and the things that you're experiencing out on the 
on the ocean at that time. So, mm. yeah, I had, but I hadn't really thought about that whole idea of having another sail that was a part of the, you know, there was like a little, there was like a set that operated together. Mm. But it's a good, you know, it, and like we said, this is the kind of mm. kaupapa and wānanga that allows us to bring these kinds of kōra up because there's no real absolutely right way or wrong way of thinking about how these things were, so... Not me. Kia ora. Actually, more than two, but... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but, but the, the other thing is that, well, you either got designs in there to make things look pretty, or they actually got things, which is okay. But you also got maybe maybe that some of the designs are thing to allow less stress on the sail. So uh, there is that inbuilt spill factor within the sail, so you don't have loading on one point exactly. The, uh, thing. But again, we'll need to trial and test. Uh, and well, when we had Te there. It was a different design by within two years because the old fellow thought, oh, this didn't work, that didn't work. We did changes mm. to, to our waka. Mm. And so I don't want the first uh, sale. We don't want the second one. But we'll have the third one. It'll be really perfect by then. <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora. Is there any, any other part Yeah, Oh, kia ora. Um, kia ora, nā mahi, uh, moto... Um, I'm really, this is a beautiful wānanga. Um, thank you for your time and energy and expertise. I'm really interested in your thoughts about the, the um, function of the feathers and, mm. well, and how they might have been used in terms of how the sail was used. So that's one question. I'll give you the other question at the same time so then you can have time to ponder. <laughs> um, is the awa mātangi, or the, the mātairangi that um, is on the, on the side, um, what your thoughts are about the function of that as well? Uh, um, regarding that, uh, the, yeah, um, I looked at the, the feathers and stuff like um, And I've sailed on, um, on, on Hokule a few times and they used a similar sort of um, feathers or fiore that blows off the off the waka and I, I've asked back those back in those those days was what was the purpose of those um, and pretty much I got an answer like well it just helps you with the likes of the the wind direction on where the wind's coming across the sail so that gives you an idea on how to trim um, how to reef and or how to sheet the sail in and get the right um, shape in the sail to allow get the most efficient part of the sail going to drive the canoe forward um, and that's that was one thing the other one was um, yes um, another quarter I remember was just to identify the type of waka it was or who they were because um, there were a lot of different colours in some of the feathers um, which I saw at, at on the Ra um, you know for me I, I, I to me that yeah I mean whether it was an identity sort of way of Representing who they, who it was and what was it what was it all about, but um, pretty much for us on the ocean, it's just more of a uh, a wind direction on how you can work your sails regarding working along with the wind, the way the wind's blowing through the sails and stuff like that. Um, but um, what was the other the second question? Oh, um, the the, the, the designs, eh? All the, all the tail and yeah, yeah. So that yeah, well, um, to me that was a yeah, that was a. I'm still trying to. Yeah, it's interesting because it's so elaborate. It's really, it's really good. And I you know, took some look at some real close shots at it. It's just like, well, I would be mataku to take. <laughs> I would be mataku to take that out on the, on the water and try that out. But yeah, um, it maybe it would be that like what I said in the beginning. It could be a, a way of. Um, indicating um, wind direction or helping with that sort of, or it could be part of a um, of a um, ceremonial sort of thing. You know, who knows? And that's that that's that sort of journey we sort of have to look into and how it was all about. Yeah, but someone might elaborate on that. Jack, what do you want to? I'm I'm pretty certain it's a wind indicator. Mm -hmm. So um, 
when your sales are going down, it's like this. It'll be like that. Oh, like that. Hold on, hold on, but the window. Hold on, right here. Okay. <laughs> so here's your sale, and here's your matairangi. You know, when it's sitting up there now, when you got the wind going, it goes like this. And so when you're sailing along, if you got your steerer at the back, he can watch it. And so if you're going off course and it starts going like this, means the wind's coming from this direction, uh, which means that his sail's not going to be as effective. Yeah. He turns again to get the, it to go forward. Um, uh, it would be like, would be like that. Uh, but when it's, when it's um, so you know how you've got it there sticking out like that? When, when the wind's blowing it, it's going to fold backwards like this. Yeah. That's what, I, that's what I was thinking. So it'll be, and it'll be fluttering with the wind. And then so it'll be going like this. And then if you're going off course, it'll come out like this. You know, or it'll go this and get hidden this way. And then you turn until you get it to this point where you, where you, where you keep the sail full. Yeah. The other thing would be, um, is, uh, is that, um, uh, you know, your uh, kaihautu, he might say, keep it here. Hey, that means you've got to turn the sail a little bit. Uh, pull on one of the one of the toda to so that because uh, the wind will be coming from a different direction mm -hmm. and uh, and that might and that might enable you to go uh, you know on a in a different direction and keep it so it not only indicates where the wind is but it indicates that you can actually turn your canoe to a certain place and keep it online mm -hmm. just by the fact that you're doing it we on, on our waka we have those we have these little uh, telltales uh, on our stays of our mast. And they do a similar thing. So, you know, we, we might just say to the steerer, make sure that the telltales are coming straight across the, across the, uh, the, so, the, uh, the, mm. the, the deck, you know, right angles to, to there, keep them there, and, and we know that he can keep a straight line. It, similar things to steer. It's, uh, it helps with the direction. Right. Yeah. That's, that's my thoughts anyway. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I fucked up a back to Muri Hiku and more particularly to Rakyu and the Shura. Do you know about the journeys that your northern folk made to Rakyu? As a boy growing up, I was told about the Bay of the Spit and Chiefs on Shura. When your ancestors came down with following winds, they came down the west coast, round, round the southern tip of Fusion Point, and the ship over Australia, and down to Juan Island. And they came down for multi purposes. Some of the journeys went ashore in Hiwaiwe Bay to get Honolulu mm. and other stones, but they were really keen to get to Rakiura to get the Titi, mm -hmm. the yeah. And when they came, they had to stand and say who they were and where they were from and what gifts they brought. And the gifts that they brought down for us were the kumara, the volcanic glass, and the kumara, which was a major delicacy. Their journey back always went up the east coast, again the following wind. And my ancestors, the Waitaha people, you realize that if they didn't go back to Pacific regularly after their first journey down here, the gene pool would suffer. Mm -hmm. And they went back into the Pacific from the very south of New Zealand, the very south of Ruck Europe. They sailed off in the southeasterly direction until they put their hands over the side and could feel the current, mm -hmm. the water current. So they had tailwind all the way back up. So I, I just like to welcome you. No, I mean, Say what an amazing yeah. event, yeah. and I'm sorry I don't have a couple of buckets of birds for you. <laughs> <laughs> So so come and get them. Yeah. We were going to say we still like the tea tea. We haven't got one more. Too deep. Can't find out exactly where that is. Um, my question is, why are the feathers notched um, and there are also zip notchings 
why are they not just split down the ratchets? So why, what, what are your hiaho to koto for karo? <laughs> for me, I think it comes back to that, um, that, that, that question of form and function. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can say, you know, I'm asking the same question as uh, you are actually, because it makes me wonder why those notches are there. My first thought is oh, maybe it's to make the feather more pliable so it can move, you know, move in a particular way where we can read the afiorangi that's coming through the waha of the sail and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the reality is for me, I would ask, I'm, st I'm still asking that same question too. Um, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's probably only going to be answered when, you know, Hotu gets his sail, oh, sorry, Jack gets his sail first. <laughs> Hotu and then, uh, you know, Joe, and I'll put my order in now. <laughs> but, so the reality for me anyway, and I, you know, my matanga here might disagree with me, but you know, I, I, yeah, I'm asking the same questions. Um, uh, following on from on that, I mean, you, for the waka hodua, for the waka, it's like um, it's, it's one of our, even though it's the waka hodua, it's like our navigation tool. So everything on that waka. It's the hulls, the steering hoy, um, the sails that are, um, the feathers that flow off, they all play a role in navigating. Um, and it's important for us, especially when you're out on the, um, on the, in, on the open ocean, you know, um, the waka is your, your centre point of your, of your star compass on the ocean. Um, the, 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 the horizon line is the boundary of your star compass and the uh, the sky and the rangi is your, is your dome or where you navigate the waka from. Um, but your waka is the navigator. You've got to point your waka in that, put it in that position. On the, and every part of those, um, the, the ra's and everything on that waka plays in the It includes those, the, what you talked about, the feathers and stuff. And following from what Hemi said, it's there yeah, they play a real crucial role in that. And it's that sort of thing we, over the years, we've, we've found out. Mm. You know, because you've got to think about it. it's been a long time since uh, and the arrival of our tupunas here um, from Polynesia to here, and then that big bridge, that big gap between them and us, you know, and goes back to this quarter to a whole bunch of Māori boys and Māori wahi, they got on a waka and went sailing, and, and then we had these amazing um, komatua and tohunga fellows that, like Mao and Hector, that um, taught, taught us that knowledge. And all of a sudden, that bridge is being built. So, um, yeah, so that's how, yeah, and it gets back again to the Ra, how this Ra is going to put us on this amazing journey of, of gathering, learning, passing down all that knowledge um, that, you know, to this morning seeing the Ra, and it's, this is what it's done, it's ignited, and it's bringing us together and how we can go on this amazing journey. And it is an amazing journey, you know. It's like on the ocean, you know, you're going to have your ups and downs and good and your bad days. But, yeah, through all those, you come out at the other end. Um, and that's like for all of us here sitting here. Um, we were once upon a time young, cocky fellows. But when you go out on the ocean, yeah, it takes you to a different place and you realise how humbling you are once that ocean done it. That's, that's, that's the amazing journey that myself and us here have done. Um, and it's just been that ever since, you know. So, yeah, it's great and it's wonderful that we're here to share that record at all. Kia ora. Can, can I just uh, quickly pick up on the um, on that record or just before we pass on? Because the, the, the idea of replication, eh, and, and testing form and function is really important with something like this. So, you know, through, through Sir Hege Nukumai's entire career, we were out... Um, measuring and looking at old waka and, you know, collecting data more or less, you know, um, to replicate some of those old shapes. And by replication, we were able to put those waka in the water and actually figure out, oh, that's how that works, that's how that performs. And we were able to refine things to the point, you know, where, where, where now we're, we're pretty sold on, you know, our designs and shaping now. But that came through Hector's own for Karo, you know, to go out and study what was available to us. And I think that's the point with Tira is that 
you know, there's this collection of data that has already happened, you know, there's replication already happening, um, but in order to really answer the question you've asked, we have to start applying that in a real-world scenario so we can collect the data on what's actually happening with those feathers. So I just wanted to say, well, the reason I'm asking as well, is that we have replicated a uh, full-size um, mahiri tuki te rangi. And, um, yeah, so Paula just wanted me to say that because we're talking about as if it hasn't happened, but it actually has happened. Yeah. We've got two sales. We've got Hine Marama, our Tawera, and Mahiri Tuki Te Rangi. Yeah, I was going to sneakily put Hine Marama on one of our little wakahama while I was eating. Well, actually, the there's, another, there's another person who's first. <laughs> <laughs> What's their but name? But if you're from <laughs> Nor, Nor Te Tai Toki Rau Kapai, <laughs> you're in with a chance. Kilda. You know him. You know him. Kilda. 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 I, I, uh, e tātou mako tai nei te mutu ngō tā tātou hui. I was fortunate to be um, to travel with uh, Ranu to pick uh, to pick up um, Tera uh, from the British Museum, and um, when we walked into the uh, into the space where it was laid out on the table for the uh, for the first time, um, it was over overcome. Uh, it was sort of like a, a, a breath come across. And, and over us as we walked in. And I immediately thought of the hands that had prepared the, uh, the Tara going back a couple of hundred years ago. And um, this is a little bit off the copa, but um, something to think about is that um, we have amongst us, Māori dim, people who operate in that spiritual space 99% of the time and 1% in the, the kauairaro. And I was uh, just over that whole, whole trip there, I was thinking of um, who it is we could identify to go in and sit with that and communicate uh, matakite um, to, to, to get, get kōrero, I suppose, because um, I'm working with um, somebody back in Whakatane, Koro, Koro Tutua, who does all of our matakite stuff, and he, the, the things he comes up with are, are from, from way back, even before Christianity. But um, it's, uh, I was just trying to make a link into um, you know, understanding some of this kōruru that, uh, uh, that uh, we are talking about. Uh, yeah, that was just a... Just laying that out there for our... Our, uh, our tohunga here. Cool, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 I nā mā taurana, uh, mai te ao tawhito, uh, ka toi o mai uh, ki tēnei ao uh, e noho nei tātou. Uh, reira, uh, rū tēnei, uh, ka i ākoe te wā, hei whakakapi tā tātou. <laughs> Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Tēnā tātou, uh, mihana ki a tātou. Uh, ko karapinipine mai tēnei wā, uh, me mihi kātikaki e nei tohunga. Uh, I tuari mai o rātou mā tauranga. Uh, he mi miharo katoa uh, ngā kōrero i puta. Uh, hoi anō tā mā tau, uh, ko, ko ha, kai hākari nei i te nui o ngā kōrero ko puta. Mm. Me te roa o tō koutou noho ki te wānanga e nei kōrero o rangatira o tātou tūpuna uh, i tēnei rā i tuku noa mai, tuku Māori mai ki, ki mua i te maria. Uh, no reira, no, no mātou te whiwhi, no mātou te maringa nui. 
um, ko tino rangatira te kaupapa i au. I au koutou. Uh, nō reira ko, ko tēnei he tore kai huru huru noi ho e, e mi haro nei uh, ki ngā kōrero i puta. Uh, me te mea anō hoki ko tino whakatō koutou i te ngākau hihiko ki roto i tēnā o tēnā o mātou kia kawea a uh, e nei kaupapa he ngā rā e tū mai nei. Uh, hoi nō tāku he, he tuku tētahi a wāhi karakia kia, kia mātea tātou uh, ki te haere. Uh, hikina, hikina te rongo mai fiti o tēnei wānanga tukua kia ea, tukua kia tau. Uh, kia whakatari anō ngā ke te mātou ranga o tātou tūpuna uh, ki ngā pātū o tō tātou whare. A tō nga wā tikina anō mai, hei wānanga, hei whera whera, uh, hei whakanui, hei whakamana mā tātou. Tūturu o whiti whakamaua kia tīna. Tīna. Huiei. Tāna kiei. Kia ora. Kia ora.